call black everything Everything black, culture over everything Y'all, we taking it back, black Welcome to Left to Black, I'm your host Mark Anthony Neal. We're joined today via Skype by two guests. Cora Daniels, who's an award-winning journalist and the author of Ghetto Nation, A Journey into the Land of Bling and Home of the Shameless, 2007, and Black Power Incorporated, The New Voice of Success, 2004. And we're also joined by John L. Jackson, Jr., cultural anthropologist and filmmaker, the Richard Perry University professor and the dean of the School of Social Policy and Practice at the University of Pennsylvania. He's the author of four books, including the now classic Harlem World, Doing Race and Class in Contemporary Black America, 2001, and the recent Then Description, Ethnography in the African Hebrew Israelites of Jerusalem, 2013, and that's a Harvard University Press book. And they are here to join us to talk about their new book on Impolite Conversation. Uh, Kirkus Reviews says it is a book of refreshing candor. Uh, how are you doing today, Cora and John? I'm doing well. I'm, I'm hoping Cora's well, too. She's in New York. I'm in Philadelphia. But just good to be on the show. Thanks for having us on, Mark. So how did this, book, how did this book come together for the two of you? Cora? <laughs> um, well, um, we've, known, we've known each other a long time. I've known John before. He was a big time professor because um, we went to high school together. And um, we um, have conversations a lot on sensitive topics. We wanted to sort of build a bridge between academia and the real world, um, since you guys talk a lot of um, interesting talk, but a lot of times that conversation doesn't filter out into <laughs> mainstream America. <laughs> um, and we wanted to um, sort of raise the level of dialogue and push people's comfort zones and, and get them to think about things in different ways so that we don't become sort of stagnant in our thoughts. You know, one of the things I like about the book, and particularly the style in which you do it with these kind of essays going back and forth, and the kind of honesty that's in the book, um, you know, that there's a kind of personal aspect. I mean, the stuff, I've known John for a long time, the stuff I never knew about John <laughs> that, that he talks about in the book, but it really does have this feel, this feel of, of, of an, you know, end time dinner party where folks are just kind of sharing stories and having those impolite conversations that you might have in your head, you might have with a partner, but you're not sitting there having, you know, with 12 people, or in this case, thousands of people, you know, who have the opportunity to read the book. Um, I'm gonna start with you, Cora, because, you know, you start the book off with a bang. Uh, talking about, you know, wanting to have our daughters have great sex. <laughs> And, and I have two daughters. I have a 16-year-old and an 11-year-old. And at least with the 16-year-old, she's at that age where, you know, <laughs> you know, if you're a father in particular, you worry about some of these things. Um, but talk about, you know, what you lay out here in terms of how we as a society think about, you know, women in general around sexuality and particularly how we pass on the conversation about sexuality and sex and the enjoyment of sex, you know, to our girls. Right, right. I mean... I mean, yes, it was, it was difficult to write this. I have an eight-year-old daughter, and you definitely don't want to think about your daughter in that space. Um, and that was sort of the point. Um, it was talking about um, healthy relationships, um, healthy adult relationships. That, that is a sexual relationship. If you want a healthy partnership, a lifelong healthy partnership, you are going to have sex, period. And, and to, to teach our daughters that that is not something to be ashamed of, that is something that they should embrace, and to sort of get to that, that ultimate enjoyment um, requires respect for your partner and respect for yourself. So when we're teaching our daughters that they should enjoy sex, we're teaching our daughters that they have to respect themselves to the utmost. That's the only way that you get sort of the curling toes in the with the and not. You know, it's funny, you, you referenced Joycelyn Elder to Jocelyn Elders, you know, which is a name that I have not thought about in a long time, and, and in some ways, you know, you know, Dr. Elder's talking about masturbation in 1994, and you know, it seems really tame, you know, in the age of reality television and exactly. scandal and how to get away with murder. <laughs> uh, but yet, you know, it's a thing that I, I think even now we'd be hesitant to pass on to our daughters, right? You know, learn how to enjoy this by actually pleasuring yourself first. Mm -hmm. Exactly, exactly. I mean, it was, it did feel like you know, I was going back into a quaint little period of time. Like, you remember when when this, um, this woman was run out of office basically for saying this? And, 
And now it's like it, her comments are tame compared to the to the world that we live in now. Um, you know, but that I mean, that's part of the point. I mean, I, I it, as as parents as as parents on a larger level, you know, is just trying to raise um, strong, independent black women, um, we have to sort of get over our own um, uncomfortableness and our own issues and really um, empower our girls to um, not, be, um, not be afraid of, of their sexuality, not be ashamed of what, what turns them on. I'm not saying that I'm keeping out my eight-year-old daughter now, okay? <laughs> you know, this is all in the context of, of growing into womanhood. And so when I think of raising my eight-year-old daughter, I think of the woman that she's going to become. You're watching Left of Black. I'm your host, Mark Anthony Neal. We're joined today by journalist Cora Daniels and also anthropologist John L. Jackson, Jr. As we talk about their new book, just published by Atria Books, called Impolite Conversations. You know, in contrast to, you know, what Cora talks about in terms of having discussions about sexuality and sex, with our daughters, you know, John, you, you write a short essay that's really about, you know, the fact that we hyper-masculinize black boys, right? And you tell a very personal story, you know, about your stepfather having that conversation with you uh, about predatory older black gay men. Um, and, and, and it's like they're all predatory older black gay men. There's, there's no middle ground there. And, and, and you read this and weave this, of course, into uh, conversations about what America might see and clearly what you know, George Zimmerman saw when they see a, a Trayvon Martin with a hood, hoodie on. Elaborate a bit about some of the concerns that you lay out in this chapter. So part of what I wanted to do there, Mark, is to say that we're actually doing two dissimilar things at the same time. Hmm. So kind of following off of what you all were talking about two seconds ago, you know, we are far removed from what we might imagine to be the rather staid discourse of the Jocelyn Elders moment. So we think we've surpassed that. But that lives actually in this interesting, weird tension with incredible kinds of insecurity about public discourse around these topics. So right. it's almost like we're schizophrenic on this stuff. We talk yeah. about everything. It's all over the Internet, all over the Web. But we still, when push comes to shove, we have all of these phobias and anxieties around what we can say in public conversation. So part of what I wanted to do was put the discussion about state violence against black men into the context of yeah. a larger conversation, which I think can be made related, right? They're not reducible to one another, but I think they're interesting ways in which they're working in cahoots to a conversation about how we think about black masculinity, period, and how we train young black boys to understand what it means to grow into men. And it's a particular version of manhood that I think is always open to dispute and debate and that we're constantly trying to transform. And so the piece is really about saying, if we think about what's happening vis-a-vis -vis the state and the killing of young black men, of course, now it seems so dated to talk about Trayvon Martin because we have right. so many other right. examples since then. But the key is to say, let's not forget that this discussion about race, about policing, about poverty is also linked to questions of identity, sexuality, and gender, even if we're not talking about those linkages explicitly. So, so the piece is really just trying to say what happens when we do, what kind of sparks fly, we put these seemingly different parts of these larger discussions into the same place. And I think what happens is you realize there isn't that, there isn't that far a distance between the kind of performance of masculinity that we're trained, that I was trained to try to inhabit mm -hmm. by my father, and the sorts of assumptions, cliches, and stereotypes of black, about black men that haunt us in the public sphere. You know, it's interesting. You mentioned Trayvon Martin, and, and almost as a memory that's been erased because of Mike Brown and, and what's happening in Ferguson. And of course, in the backdrop of Ferguson, there's Ray Rice, and then of course, Adrian Peterson. And, and, and you talk, you know, in that particular section about, you know, the issue of, of beatings. Um, and, and, and how, you know, in some, way, in some ways your stepfather had almost a workman-like quality, <laughs> you know, to the way that he dispensed physical discipline. And, but yet you always repeatedly go back to that piece about wanting you to lie down, um, you know, which is an interesting way to frame beatings and particularly in talking about black masculinity. You know, in, in the aftermath of, of everything that we now know about Adrian Peterson and these rich discussions that we have had about how African Americans discipline their children, particularly boys, you know, how do you feel about what you presented in that particular section of the book? In some ways, it couldn't be more timely. I mean, yeah. it's, it's uncanny, of course, that all of this stuff is blown up as the book came out. I mean, this, it really is 
a piece in very elliptical and subtle ways, but I hope in ways that resonate with some readers about abuse and about what, right. how we define abuse, right. right? And so that's physical abuse, but it's also emotional and mental abuse. But we want to imagine abuse with a capital A, almost kind of like a scarlet letter. And there are abusers in this camp. It's clear cut where they are and how they operate. They're to be criminalized and demonized and the like. Then there's everyone else over here. And I think part of what I want that short essay to explain and to demonstrate is that it's not that cut and dry, that we're all, in some ways, part of what it means to be human is to always be susceptible to these forms of domination over the other. Even when you imagine you're doing it with their best interest at heart, in some ways, that's how you sleep at night. That's how it works. Because I know my stepfather, I say, I always say two things about my stepfather when I talk about the kind of ways in which he dealt with um, his attempt to do corporate uh, punishment. One was to say that this it was kind of the best he could do, right? This is how he was trained, right? The Adrian Peterson response, right? The Adrian Peterson defense. This is how he was raised. But I think the other part of it, though, is, you know, he was trying to find a way to articulate his sense of what it meant to be a citizen in the contemporary moment with the only tools he had at his disposal. And he wasn't just an abuser. And I think, and and, I, and I'm not even sure he was an abuser. There are moments when I think, well, that's, you know, he, he was heavy handed at moments. He always has a different remember, memory of what was going on during those interactions. But I think we have to be careful not to imagine that what we're trying to do is separate out the wheat from the chaff, that there's some easy, obvious reification that can explain where the abusers are and where abuse begins and ends and say, actually, everyday life is about a much more subtle and dynamic and really kind of intimate form of interaction that's always susceptible to kind of that devolution into abuse and, um, and the kind of stuff that we know we want to imagine uh, we can spot from afar and disentangle from our everyday lives. You know, Cora, throughout the book, you, the both of you talk about sex, re religion, race, I mean, all the kind of hot button topics, and then, of course, politics and money. And, and, and your chapter on, you know, this idea that we're not all moving on up, you know, on the one hand made me chuckle because, you know, my father, rest his soul, you know, he never failed to sit me down when I was adult and ask me how much money I made. In, in some ways, it was a measure of who he, you know, he could measure whatever his success was as a parent, you know, in terms of what my salary was. Um, and, and he, you know, he was never embarrassed by that. You know, it's the kind of thing that we're taught in polite society. We don't roll up on people and ask them <laughs> how much money they make, you know, even if they're family members. Um, but you also get it to this point, Cora, in a very honest way that, you know, we visibly see some sort of successes and not everybody is tied to those successes. So talk a little bit about some of the concerns that you raise, you know, in the section of the book about, you know, how we think about wealth and, and money, particularly as it relates to black folks in the country at this point in time. Um, yeah, I wanted to, I mean, I wanted to talk about how mobility is, is really a myth in, in the current, in our current moment, um, and that, um, um, you know, we're, it's, we're not, we're not sort of jumping class anymore. Yeah. Um, and, yeah. and, and, and we really are a society of, a, a tax system. Um, and, and, and we're not sort of moving on, moving up. Um, and if we, if we acknowledge that, I think, I think part of us, uh, you know, part of, part of our, the American culture is to sort of ignore that, to sort of always be hopeful that that can, that can happen. And if we, we embrace that that, that, that just is not happening, um, then, then how do we sort of improve where we are at the moment and, and redefine our, our, our definitions of success and, and, and make sort of life better for today? Um, you know, because I think that there's just not an acknowledgement that that's just not an and it's not happening anymore. You know, one of the things that's very poignant that you write, Cora, you know, when you talk about the success that you've had, you know, professionally, your husband's had successfully, um, professionally, but what you still don't feel is though, you know, you have anything to fall back on. And, 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 and you have to wonder, you know, how that translates into how we parent. You know, you talk about the fact that, you know, having the conversation or not having the conversation, you know, with your, with your daughter about why she goes to school so far. <laughs> From, from where you live, and those are very real realities that at some point we don't think twice about because we're just trying to create better possibilities for our children, um, but we have to wonder what our children are thinking about. You know, I, I think if we're good parents, they always think that they have a safety net, but we carry on those anxieties no matter what our success is. Right, no, I mean, it's, it's a very, I, 
it, it's something that I think about a lot because um, my husband and I are in a very different position economically now when we're raising our children than, mm-hmm. than, than the life that, that we went to. We were both um, uh, first generation um, to, um, to get a college degree. And so in, in our family circles, we, we, are, we are the success. We are the people people still ask for money for. <laughs> Meanwhile, you know, we are really just hands to mouth in terms of the, the larger scale of, of, you know, American, not that, you know, we're living on a street corner. I, I don't want to say that. And I definitely, you know, I live, um, you know, much better than, than the way I grew up. Yeah. But there's yeah. definitely not a sort of comfort level there. Yeah. And, you know, just, I mean, even today, my, my son asked me if I was going on their class trip. And I was like, no, because I have to work. And he was like, why do you have to work? And I was like, well, I have to work so we can pay the mortgage and we have a house to live in. And um, I'm very honest with my children that, that you know, the money just doesn't appear that, that, that daddy and I work hard so we can pay these bills, you know. And, and that's, that's the same. I mean, you know, I was very aware of that growing up. Um, you know, it was, even if my parents didn't say it, you know, I was very aware of the of struggles that we had financially. And I don't, I think that it's valuable um, to, to keep those conversations up. Even if your status has changed, there's still a financial struggle there. And your, your children should still be aware of the hard work it takes to get to wherever point you are. You're watching Left of Black. I'm your host, Mark Anthony Neal. We're joined by journalist Cora Daniels and University of Pennsylvania professor, anthropologist, uh, John L. Jackson, talking about their new book, In Polite Conversations, which was just published by Atria Books. Uh, of course, the most explosive parts of this book, um, you know, Cora's admission about getting through that box of condom with her, condoms with her husband <laughs> a week after they met, notwithstanding, <laughs> the, the most explosive stuff in the book, of course, is in the race section. And, 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 you know, Cora comes with it, you know, this idea of fuck the N-word, you know, this is the beauty of doing interle- internet programming, fuck the N-word, bring back nigger, <laughs> you know, and, and, you know, in talking about how the way that we've created these euphemisms, you know, really don't help, you know, all it does is really sanitize hatred. Um, talk about, you know, how we have an honest conversation about race that's rooted in an obvious conversation about the word nigger. Um, yeah, I mean the the N word is, is literally like my pet peeve for life. I absolutely, <laughs> I absolutely hate it, um, and I hate the hypocrisy of folks who can criticize the who can criticize the hip hop generation for using nigga yeah. and then mm-hmm. will use the N word in the same breath. It's the mm-hmm. exact same thing. So you know, I'm on I'm on the I'm criticizing both because just say say what it is. And as a writer, where words are my weapon to to try to sanitize. Um, um, to sanitize language and to erase history is, is outrageous and offensive. And um, so, so, so yes, and um, um, you know that, and and that, you know, and that's something that folks that folks don't say. So we can have a whole, con- you know, your 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 world, you guys are all this academia mind is the newsroom. So we can have these whole conversations in the newsroom, debating like headlines and things, and like our discussions at news meetings about the N word, where no one says that the word, but there would be, they would not even be able to have that conversation if we actually use nigger, 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 nigger. <laughs> and, and, and Sean, in your, one of your pieces in the section on race, uh, and, and of course, I'm sitting here looking at Cora, and, 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 and you admit it, right? You know, all, all of my best friends, right, are, are light-skinned women, <laughs> and, and, and trying to work through, you know, first of all, to publicly have that conversation, right? Because, you know, we're still, you know, as a community, you know, we're still deeply invested in, in skin politics. You know, there's no question about that. When we see the kind of responses that we had, you know, either in a celebratory mode around Lupitu, uh, but even much more complicated around someone like Viola Davis, you know, quote unquote, not being classically beautiful, you know, we still are a community that's color struck, and now white people are in on the conversation that we're color struck. Um, so, talk a little bit about what you're working through when you realize, you know, as you say, looking at your wedding pictures. That, you know, all of your best friends are light-skinned women. <laughs> yeah, no, and, and, and I will say part of what I found so wonderful about writing that piece. So, well, let me just say a couple of things up front. Firstly, not all of my best friends are light-skinned women. So it does run the gamut. But, but the point of the provocation is to say we shouldn't imagine somehow we've transcended those right. colorist issues. Right? right. So we don't talk about it the way I think people used to talk about it a generation or two ago. 
So we imagine somehow that we've gotten past it. But the key is to recognize that's not true. And the more we kind of sort of bottle up and repress these discussions about how color still informs people's lives and life chances, I think the less robust the serious discussions will have both intraracially and interracially about what it might even mean to imagine a post-racial world, right? So we have this fantasy about getting beyond race. And part of what I wanted to say in that book is we haven't even gotten beyond color vis-a-vis -vis these <laughs> racial categories of yore. And so there's so many different layers. And so I wanted to say when, when, when people, when I look at the folks I'm closest to, especially the black women, a lot of the black women are light skinned, they're not all light skinned, but we often don't even talk about that stuff anymore. And to just be able to put that back on the table and say, this isn't just an old school conversation that our grandparents had, this is still real. We've just found other ways to euphemize and bracket out what we're still grappling with, either, you know, either implicitly or in ways that get played out in terms of our the aesthetics of our music videos and our mm -hmm. filmic choices mm -hmm. and all that mm -hmm. kind of thing. I mean, just think about this debate about Nina Simone and who can play her, right? right. All that's about the kind of nature of color, phenotype, and how race is embodied in specific ways. And we need to remember that that's a debate that isn't going to go away simply because we want to imagine a world when race no longer matters. Yeah. Cora, what are you hoping to, you know, what, what's the response been so far to the book? <laughs> <laughs> um, I, think, I think it's been good. I think folks are a bit surprised. Um, there's, there's so, I mean, it, it, it is, we were trying to recreate this, this, this all night sort of dinner table conversation. So there's a lot in there. So it's interesting. Folks will sort of gravitate towards one one thing or another rather than you know the whole um, a lot of the, the essays. Um, we're hoping to push people out of their comfort zone and sort of have these conversations um, um, in circles where they they normally wouldn't, and you know really sort of say these these thoughts out loud. I mean John's essay with the you know, the admission to license was one of one of my favorite essays because because it was it, to me it was hilarious that he was actually um, admitting this that he was, that an academic would say this publicly was was brilliant to me. Um, um, you know, so I think it's some of those those more personal moments. Um, you know, for it was interesting. Also, Mark, how you said you know John for a long time, but you you know you didn't you didn't really know him, and I think that's how John and I felt. Also, we've known each other for for you know twenty five plus years, and we felt when we read the book, it was like, well, I guess I didn't really know you at all. Um, and that, and that it, to me, is a success, basically, because it means that we have gotten past that comfort zone and actually had some honest thoughts. And, and we're trying to be honest in ways, Mark, that are both self-conscious and self-critical, too. Yeah, so it's right. also about recognizing that your job isn't just to criticize everybody else and what they do, but to look, and this is, I think, the best parts of what anthropology can offer to any conversation, but to try to allow your critical faculties to examine what you take for granted. And so I'm hoping that, you know, the, when the joke is on us and where we're pushing and ribbing ourselves, it's also about trying to have conversations that actually get us to think in newfangled ways about how to be critical citizens in the 21st century. Because I do think that's part of the project ultimately as well. You know, one of the things I, I really appreciated about, you know, the book Cora and John is that, you know, it, it's despite the title and the subject matter, it is unapologetically black. <laughs> You know, th th this is a conversation about black people in some ways, you know, among black folks. You know, white folks can be part of the conversation, but this is not a book that's trying to have these conversations with white folks. And, and, and I think that's a really important distinction in terms of the kind of work that you want to do, because it really talks about the fact that these impolite conversations are issues within black communities also. Um, mm -hmm. and, and we're so focused on the translation piece <laughs> you know, to folks outside of our communities that, you know, that we're not even really careful to, to have these real significant kind of even intimate conversations with ourselves. Mm -hmm. That's a nice way to think about it, Mark. I do feel like there used to be that old trope of airing dirty laundry, right? Like, you know, that there's so much we kind of talk about in hush cone t tones in the corners of our own respective private um, spaces. But I do feel like this is a book that says, you know, even before we start to imagine having really substantive dialogue in mixed company, yeah. that there are a whole bunch of things one can say and do amongst folks you imagine be family and friends and intimates that would be the starting off point, like the springboard to these larger kind of multifaceted and, and heterogeneous discussions with other parts of the body politic. You've been watching Left of Black and we've been joined today by journalist Cora Daniels. 
award-winning journalist who's the author of Ghetto Nation, A Journey into the Land of Bling and the Home of the Shameless, 2007, and also Black Power, Inc., The New Voice of Success, 2004, and Professor John L. Jackson, Jr., called an anthropologist filmmaker at the University of Pennsylvania, where he is the Richard Perry University Professor and Dean of the School of Social Policy and Practice. He is also the author of four books, including Harlem World, Doing Race and Class in Contemporary Black America, and the recently published Then Description, Ethnography and the African Hebrew Israelites of Jerusalem. Thank you both for joining us. Thanks for having us, Mark. Thank you. Black lights and boots burn when I record for Watts And every black like Troy Davis who never had a fair shot All black everything, everything black Culture over everything, y'all